want to welcome everybody to this first event of, uh, of uh, 2011 in our Social Sciences Occasion Lecture Series. And most of you uh, probably know me. Uh, I'm Nina Rosenstand. I am Professor of Philosophy uh, here at Mesa, and I chair this series. So that leads me to uh, introducing our speaker, uh, who is Emeritus Professor of History from uh, San Diego State, Paul Vanderwood. And uh, his special uh, interest and expertise is in Mexican history. And uh, he is a published author, uh, a frequent speaker of, uh, at events. And his latest book is this one here, which has the uh, alluring title of Satan's Playground, Mobsters and Movie Stars at America's Grace, Greatest Gaming Resort. Oh, and if people read that title and they wonder, where might that be, then our title of this paper will actually tell you where it is, because what um, Professor Vanderwood is going to talk about today is Oh, Satan's Playground, Mobsters and Movie Stars at Agua Caliente, Tijuana, the world's greatest gaming resort. Uh, so uh, I welcome uh, Paul Vanderwood. Um, please okay, take, take the Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here at uh, Mesa. I don't get up here too often, but once in a while, whenever I do, I always enjoyed myself here. I know a lot of people here, a lot of people on the faculty and so forth. It's a wonderful school and it's, uh, I can, was amazed by all the growth that's going on all the time here. It's, it's just pretty wonderful to see. Um, the book is, uh, yes, it is for sale. It's about San Diego and Tijuana and that's what has a special interest for some people from this particular area and it hasn't been, the story hasn't been told Previously, so those of you who are especially interested in what we call local history, local history about ourselves here, uh, the book may have some special interest for you uh, there, and it's um, it, it, it'll expand on what I it expands on what I have to say uh, today to you, and has some uh, pretty nice photographs in it. So if you're interested in it, I'll be glad to inscribe it to you, and uh, we'll do that after we're done with a with a little talk here, okay? And then after the talk, which will be 40 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe something like that, I'll take some questions, certainly, and try to answer them, and maybe you'll have some comments. Uh, I, some of the places I go to speak and so forth, some of the people, some of the people, some of the older people, people more my age and so forth, actually knew Agua Caliente. They, they went to Agua Caliente. They knew what it was about and they enjoyed it there. Agua Caliente, this great resort which flourished just below the border uh, during Prohibition during the 1920s and well into the 1930s and then after that continued as a racetrack. Well, a lot of people know it as a racetrack but before that there was a huge beautiful resort there and we'll talk about the coming and going of that particular resort. Just a few biographical words. Um, I was born in, in Brooklyn, New York, and raised in uh, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River. And I was a newspaper reporter for quite a period of time, almost 15 years, before I turned into history and, and academia. As a newspaper reporter, I had a wonderful career, a very interesting career. I was sent from New York down to Memphis, Tennessee at the time of the Civil Rights Movement. And Scripps Howard, that was the people who owned my, the paper that I was working for, they owned a whole chain of newspapers. They sent me down there because they wanted a northerner, a Yankee, down there in the Mid-South to report on those events which were going on at the uh, time. So I was there when uh, Little Rock High School was uh, integrated and when the University of Mississippi accepted its first uh, black person. I knew Martin Luther King very well. I didn't know him. Uh, I had left by the time he became a, what well, let's just call a superstar. But I, um, I knew him in the earlier days when he would come to the churches in Memphis and he would talk to the congregations about his, um, his crusade. And I was the only white person in the whole church. He would say, come on here, sit here next to me, and we're going to talk about uh, the future here. And he was just, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, we, I, I, I didn't uh, have the opportunity to really forward his campaign, but I was just simply a reporter 
uh, talking about it in the newspaper. And the other person I knew extremely well and was assigned to cover was somebody you may have heard of, may have, I'm a little obscure. His name was Elvis Presley. And uh, Elvis and I, this was the beginning of Elvis Presley's career. He had done You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. He had done Heartbreak Hotel, his first two great hits. And we'd go out at night and drink beer and carry on and have a good time and so forth. And so I knew Elvis at those very early years. I was assigned to follow him into the Army. Uh, not myself go into the Army, but to follow him through the recruiting process. And that's where I lost, um, I lost track of him. And then, of course, after he came out of the Army, he became a, a superstar. And I, he didn't remember me, I don't believe, and I couldn't get near, I couldn't get near him. He came, to Memphis, he came to San Diego very late, just before he died, as a matter of fact. And I tried to get to see him. He was staying downtown in a hotel. But um, his people would not let me, uh, would not let me talk to him. So um, uh, I don't even know if they said to Elvis, your old friend Paul Vander was here, if he even remembered that. But I did know him pretty well at that particular time. Anyhow, after then a newspaper career, we're now in the mid, uh, the mid 1960s, I made a decision to go back to college and get a PhD in history. I had become very interested in Latin America at the time. Why? It was a very personal reason. The reason was because I felt that if we're gonna know, if I was gonna know myself, know my own culture, know why I think the way I think and the things I do the way I do, things I've learned from my parents and in school and so forth and so on. In order to understand them fully, I needed to have a sounding board. I needed to have another culture to bounce them against, okay? Nowadays, in, in places like Mesa College, it's entirely different. You have a wonderful, you can just look across the room and you can just see different cultures. So you have a good chance there to weigh the, the, the confluence and the variations in the cultures and make your own decisions about what seems good and what seems bad. I didn't have that. So I went to Latin America for a little bit and came back and I became interested in Mexico because I went to the University of Texas and Texas has a very good library on, uh, on Mexico. So I naturally was pushed into Mexico and, and then I wanted to work on the border. I wanted to be near Mexico. And there aren't many schools along the border, many colleges along the border. So San Diego State was one of them. They happened to have an opening. And so I taught Mexican history there for uh, 25 years and wrote on Mexico. And I steadily moved further, further north in my writings. I started in Mexico City with my dissertation and then moved up to Chihuahua, wrote about that's the north, northern state of Chihuahua. And finally, I moved to the border. And the last couple of books I've written have been about the border and about border culture. And there's a lot about border culture in um, in this in this in this particular book, okay? And I'll make a remark about that as we're going through the talk. Well, let me go on and talk about this uh, event, okay? And this great resort called Agua Caliente and how it got started and who started it and those sorts of uh, those sorts of things, all right? I want to take you back to the month of May. The weather's just much like it is outside today, May 1929. And uh, picture you're moving from the border, San Isidro. You're moving north through National City. You're in a car. You're moving north through National City, coming up toward San Diego. And on, on May 20th, uh, in that particular year, in 1929, a 1929 Cadillac Coupe was making that journey, coming from the border up through National City, approaching San Diego. And following that car, or at least the car in back of it, okay, was a, a Model A black Ford. And it was, had been arranged in certain ways, that Ford. The windshield had been taken out of it and the side doors had been fixed in certain ways. And when those two cars, it turns out the black one was following the Cadillac, get on a place, got on a place called the Dyke. You can still see it as you go down, uh, down uh, Highway 5. It's where the Choyas Creek flows into the bay. There's a slough there. There's a lot of water and um, marshland and so forth. So there was a narrow bridge there. And when the two cars got on the bridge, suddenly, People in the back car pulled out 
automatic weapons, they pulled out machine guns, and they began shooting at that Cadillac in front of them, okay? And they shot out the tires of that car, and so that car had to stop. They stopped behind it, the two guys got out of the back car, the black car, okay, came up to the front car, and they shouted, give us the bag, give us the bags. But the people in the front car did not just hand over whatever this bag was. What they did was would pull out automatic weapons of their own and start shooting back. And they, one, of the, one of the people who was asking for the bag was, happened to be shot in the shoulder. And a, and a shootout occurred, and the two people who were in the front car, in the Cadillac, carrying the bag, were killed. They were massacred. They were filled with plenty of bullets. Okay? And um, then the people who were trailing reached in back of the car. They pulled out this bag that I'm talking about, okay? And they got back in their car, went around the front car, and steamed off into Logan Heights and off into the safety of, uh, as they saw it anyhow, of, of, of San Diego. So San Diego then had suffered a terrible massacre on this place called the Dyke, which is just abutting there, Highway 5. And it was especially important, especially important in the local news, and indeed the national news, because it was the first time that a machine gun had ever been used on the West Coast. Yes, plenty of machine guns back there in Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, and so forth, but never on the West Coast. Oh boy, this is news. The mobs have reached the West Coast, okay? The Capones, Lanskys, and so forth are now on the West Coast. We know it because they have these machine guns out here. The papers, the San Diego Union, said thugs riddle car with machine gun. Machine gunmen shoot down two in auto holdup. The San Diego Union began its coverage employing the tactics of Chicago's gangland the crime was absolutely typical of gangster methods as practices in our big cities. It was big time stuff, okay? It was like terrorists hitting San Diego, right? It was a first time thing. The San Diego Sun, which was a big newspaper here at the time, said in an editorial, now that the machine gun brand, excuse me, the machine gun breed of bandits has arrived in San Diego, we would, be de we would do well to recognize that we are in a state of war. The police department should be provided with machine guns and armored cars. Every officer should be taught to shoot quickly and straight. A war college should be established at police headquarters and carefully studied plans formulated for immediate action in case, in case an outbreak of banditry in any designated section of the city occurs. So there you have how the citizens of San Diego uh, reacted to this. It's, it was a typical kind of thing that happens in these cities that are out of the way, okay? They're kind of happy in the sense or kind of in a, in a certain way surprised and happy that they're part of the national program finally. Instead of being a little old city out there on the west coast, they were all of a sudden part of the national program. A bad part of it, okay? The mobs are part of it, but they were part of it, okay? And of course the other part is that this terrible slaughter occurred on the dike and the presence of machine guns was, 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 was announced. Now, what were they after? What were these bandits, we'll call them, or mobsters, what were they after? What was this bag, this bag all about that they, were, they took from the car, okay, this front car? And the bag contained the weekend's receipts. The weekend's receipts, they thought it would be about a million dollars, weekend receipts, a million dollars, from this casino resort which had started up, had begun, had opened, in Tijuana the previous year. Okay. So what they wanted was, what they thought they were getting, and they did get the receipts, it wasn't as much as they hoped for, but they did get the receipts from this fabulous casino. The casino itself and uh, the surroundings around it were um, world-renowned. It had only been open about a year or more, okay? But it was compared to Monte Carlo in Europe, 
Deauville in France, these, these aristocratic places that people, the Hoi Polloi, went to be, to, 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 for, their, for their pleasures, okay? And indeed, it was a, a, a beautiful, beautiful resort. They had, uh, you know, they had the swimming pool and they had the hotel and uh, wonderful eating and uh, restaurants and the best entertainment was brought over from where New York or Chicago to, uh, to perform there. The horse race track hadn't opened yet. It opened the following year, but they had the world famous, they had a world famous golf tournament there, bridge tournament. But the big money maker, as it is in all these places, is the casino. Okay? That's the way it is in Las Vegas. All this other stuff that goes on out there with shows and those sorts of things and museums to visit, that they're nothing. They don't make any money. Okay? It's the casinos that make the money. And this casino was really pulling in the money there in Agua Caliente. No wonder then that, the, uh, that these bandits wanted their, um, their share of it. Now, who, who went to Agua Caliente, this, this beautiful, uh, beautiful resort, and I'll tell you more about the architecture and so forth at the proper time, but it was attended by everyone, okay? Maharajas from India came over. Diplomats from Europe came over. The Secretary of Defense of the United States went there, okay? And politicians and blue bloods and aristocrats uh, regularly went there. And of course, we're close to Hollywood, so it was frequented by movie stars and the movie moguls, you know, the moguls being the great producers of the period, Metro Golden Mayor, Mayor from Metro Golden Mayor, Jack, Jack Warner, Otto Shank, and the rest of them were regulars there in the gambling hall. They had their own gambling room that they went to and did their, uh, and did their, and did their, did their, did their gambling. And the whole purpose of these kinds of resorts, and it's true in Las Vegas today, is to get the people there Okay, get them there for a period of time. So you got to give them a little something extra to do. You want them to stay for two or three days, right? And especially if they're taking a drive there or getting there in some way. Get them there and keep them there. Keep them there for two or three days. Don't let them go back home again. Keep them there, okay? So you can empty their wallets and empty their pocketbooks. That's what they do in Las Vegas. Las Vegas was started on the desert, right? Way out there. And if you went there, you wouldn't go just for a day or so. You'd go for a couple of days, and so you'd be sure to be you'd be sure to be cleanly picked by the time you decided it was time uh, time to go home. But that's the whole philosophy of it, okay? And um, and some of the casinos, it's pretty obvious. The ones up in Michigan, for instance, they're on an island in the middle of Lake Michigan, okay? And if you go, if you get out on the island, you can't get off the island until they take all your money. Then you can get off the island and go back to your to your home again. Anyhow, um, the movie stars flocked to this place. Clark Abel, um, Charlie Chaplin, Gloria Swanson went there regularly, uh, Clara Bow, um, Wallace Beery, uh, Constance Bennett, Douglas Fairbank toting his little boy, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. So you name them, you name them, and they, um, they went there. And of course, the mobsters went there too, because the mobsters wanted their share, so to speak. Their, when they see money, they want their share. So Al Capone went there, visited there, but the, but the one who was best noted for going to Agua Caliente, best gangster, was Bugsy Siegel. Okay? Bugsy Siegel, remember, was a spinoff from one of the Chicago gangs. Okay, and he had come out west to make his own mark. He was still in his third, his young guy at the time. Okay, and he had fallen out with some of the big wheels back in Chicago. So he came out to the west coast. He went down to Agua Caliente and he said, boy, this place is great. This place is where I can make my, uh, make my living, how I can make my living. So he took the example of what was at Agua Caliente, and in 1946, he put it out there on the Strip. It became the first casino resort on the Strip called the Flamingo, okay? Modeled after the idea uh, then of Agua Caliente, and so much for then um, Bugsy Siegel. And of course, um, a lot of folks like us went there too, right? Run kind of, I don't want to call us ordinary, but we are ordinary, and maybe we should be proud of that, okay? 
But we would go to those places, just like we now go to the Del Carnot Hotel once in a while and see places like that, because it was glorious and the entertainment was beautiful and you would, you could, you'd, you'd, you may lose a little money, but perhaps not, uh, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not too much. And um, it was, it was different going to Agua Caliente than it is going to some of these other celebrity spots now, okay? The problem now is you can't get near the celebrity. Right? You can't get near them. They're surrounded by police. They're surrounded by reporters and so forth and so on. Oh, my goodness, you know, it, it'll... When you see the Academy Awards in two weeks, you'll see those people are, are protected like they're President <coughs> Obama. They have all kinds of guards around them. You just can't get near them. That wasn't true at Agua Caliente, okay? You could go and shake hands with Clark Abel. How you doing, Clark? Or you can go in the swimming pool with Clara Bow. Miss Bo, would you mind taking a swim with me so somebody can take our picture? I mean, you could hobnob with these important, well, at least these celebrities, let's call them that. I won't call them all important people. They were celebrities, and you could get to them, and you could get to know them, and you could ask them questions. I don't know how they answered all the questions, but they were, they were open, entirely different than it is, is today where you can't get near any, any, any of these people, okay? So... People like us went to see the great golf tournaments, and uh, Gene Saracen and Ben Hogan, the great golfers at the time, went there. Johnny Weissmuller, who later became the Tarzan of the movies, was one of, an Olympic swimmer. He would swim. He'd go swimming, put on demonstrations in the great in the great swimming pool there. And when the racetrack um, finally opened, which was in 1930, beginning of 1931, the end of 1930, uh, the best racehorses in the world came there to do their racing. Far Lap was the greatest horse, he probably the greatest race horse of all time. He was from Australia, and they put him on a boat and they brought him over to Agua Caliente. It was the only race he ever raced in the United States, okay, for those of you who like horse racing. Far Lap was his name, and of course he broke the course record while he was there, he got the largest purse while he was there, and then he died mysteriously soon after racing, soon after racing there at Agua Caliente. They, they put him up in San Francisco. He was going to race up there at a famous track up there, but he died before he got a chance to race. And the question is, well, why did this great horse, great horse, why did this great horse die? You know, who, and there are lots of stories about whatever happened to whatever happened to, to, to Far Lap. The Australians still don't forgive us for the death of for the death of Far Lap. We shipped him back to Australia. He's on display. If you go to Melbourne, Australia, you can see Far Lap there, all filled with what these taxidermists fill these horses with, and so forth. And so on. Okay. All right. It was also the uh, the set for many movies. This great uh, resort. Okay, in Caliente was probably the most famous one. That was a Busby, um, Busby Berkeley movie at the time. And uh, a young lady, uh, she was only 16 at the time, began to um, dance there. And she was a, her father had sort of put her out in the main patio during lunches and so forth, and she would dance because they had Mexican music and they had U.S. bands and so just playing there while we were having a, a lunch usually selected from a French menu. And um, so she danced there, and then one of the Hollywood producers said, gee, she's, she's a pretty good dancer, and she's a nice-looking young lady and so forth. I'm going to take her to Hollywood, okay, and see maybe she'd become a movie star, okay? And so he did. He did. He took her, and her nickname was Rita. Who was it? <coughs> Rita, everybody knows that. Rita Hayworth got her start at Agua Caliente and became the love goddess for people like, I see a few people here who yeah, <laughs> knew her as a love goddess. <laughs> okay, great. Um, 
So 11 million people crossed the border, and that's a lot, a lot of people in 1929 to go to, we, I'm not sure how many of those went to Agua Caliente, because I'm using customs records here now to, just, to figure out how, how many people may have gone down there. But millions, <coughs> millions of people went to, uh, to Agua Caliente. And, you know, they had classy shops there. You could buy things that cut red perfumes and leather jackets and things from Europe and those sorts of things. So there were many, many reasons, and the, um, the, the, the various clubs would meet down there, the teachers' union met down there, and so it was a, quite, an, quite, quite an attraction. Now, um, how, did this, how did this all get started? How did this all get started? I don't want to say that Agua Caliente was the beginning, was the beginning of Tijuana's, Tijuana's period of reveling in what some people call vice and other people call pleasure. Okay. We've set Agua Caliente about 1928, 29, 1930, sort of in, during, during Prohibition. But before that, before that, Tijuana had also established itself as a place for, as I say, the so-called vices and pleasures. They had at the casinos and they had their honky-tonks and they had some pretty, cla pretty classy places also. Now, why did it occur? Why did this occur in Tijuana? Huh? Because in the beginning of, that, of the last century, the 20th century, okay, there was a group of Americans, a number of Americans, who started a movement, a reform movement in the United States called the Progressive Movement. Okay, the word is a hot word because it means you're really progressing. Some people didn't think there was so much progress being made. But anyhow, these reformers then started this huge movement of changing America. And in a political sense, what they wanted to do was get rid of the bosses in the cities because the bosses were, would run, were ran Chicago and ran New York and ran Boston, Boss Curley in Boston and so forth. The bosses and their coterie of people ran the particular cities and they wanted, these reformers wanted to bring democracy, wanted to bring voting, anyhow, wanted to bring the people back into the picture again, okay? So that was one of their, one of their platforms. And economically, they wanted to level the playing field some and make it easier. The, the, um, the Gilded Age had produced these, these very rich people and, um, you, you know, the, the, the Huntington and railroad people and others. And, uh, they wanted to, to somehow level that out, but, but not most of all, perhaps, but in a very important way, they also wanted to change the way Americans behaved. They wanted to change our social behavior, okay? A big thing, big, and that means changing our, maybe our culture, because we usually behave the way our culture teaches us to behave or invites us to behave, however you want to look at that sort of thing. And so they began to, uh, as these progressives began to be successful in various elections, they took over state houses, they became state legislators, they became the mayors and city councils of various cities, and they began to take over local government, okay, not so much the federal government yet, but later the federal government, and they began then to impose various regulations on the public in, in determining the way they behaved. So gambling was outlawed, horse racing was outlawed, prostitution was outlawed, uh, everything, not everything people like to do, I almost made a mistake there, no. Uh, but these things that people regularly did without any kind of restriction were, were outlawed. Dancing was outlawed in Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles outlawed dancing, okay? Other cities didn't outlaw dancing, but you couldn't touch your partner. That was in days when partners liked to touch. It's not like today. Partners like to touch them. So it's a, it, it was, it's a huge reform that's going on, okay? You're change, trying to change people's lives. Now, what about the people, then, who ran the so-called vice establishments? Okay, what did they, what was their, they, they were put out of business by these laws. So people like, and just as one little example, Carl Withington was the fellow's name, he owned, uh, he, he controlled prostitution in the city of Bakersfield, California. Okay? 
It was a huge deal. He was a very wealthy man because Bakersfield had, had, had gone through an, uh, an oil boom in the early 1900s. So there were lots of people there, guys there, who worked on oil wells and oil rigs and so forth. And they liked their body entertainment. They liked to gamble and they liked prostitutes and they liked all those things that were now outlawed. So Withington was put out of business and he said to himself, what am I going to do? And others, of course, said the same thing. They decided they would go south of the border into Mexico and they would reestablish their vice enterprises in Mexico, in places like Tijuana, places like Ciudad Juarez, Mexicali, and so forth, right along the Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California border. And Mexico at the time was going through a revolution, okay? And uh, there was con contentiousness over which side would win. This was the Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata revolution and the Constitutionalist Revolution in Mexico. Okay? And uh, the Tijuana area, the northern part of Baja California, that would be the northern part of Baja California, was controlled by a one faction which was called the Constitutionalists, and they had sent a general there to keep things under control. That man's name was Cantu. So you have a general in control then of that particular area, and Withington, the Withingtons, that type of person, wanting to establish their businesses in, 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 in the area. Okay? So what did they do? They made a deal. They made a deal with the acting governor of northern Baja California, Cantu, Okay, for the right to establish then their casinos and other sorts of enterprises in a place like Tijuana or, 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 or Mexicali. Okay? Now this business relationship was very interesting uh, because what it, what it showed was that uh, Americans couldn't just go down there and start things up. Okay? You had to pay for it. You had to pay a bribe for it. You had to pay the governor all for it, and the governor's coterie of support, all for it, and they did. They made so much money in their enterprises than they could afford to pay these enormous, they were really large bribes, but there was another factor involved. And we see it right in the contracts that these people signed with these governors. The governors insisted that these entrepreneurs from the United States opening up things like casinos and so forth, also contributed to the welfare of the people of northern Baja California. Okay? And it was written in their contracts. You want to open a casino, Withington? Okay, you can open a casino, but you must build four schools around Tijuana. You must put in bridges. You must build roads. You must build a municipal building. You must do this and that. It's in the contract. If you didn't do it, you would lose your license to the casino, which you didn't want to do. Okay. So there was a, a kind of a, a, a mutual relationship that went on there between then the people, the, the, the Mexicans who were in charge then of, their, of these particular areas and could control the licensing that went on in those areas and the American entrepreneurs who hoped to do work there. Now, it's very interesting that uh, I just read before coming up here in the New York Times this morning that an American company which has been doing business in Mexico, okay, has been paying certain bribes to the people there for the right to do the business, okay? And now the, the U.S. government wants to um, indict them and prosecute them for paying these bribes in order to do the business in, in Mexico, okay? So I don't know what's going to come of that, but the point is that the process which I'm talking about which was in effect in Northern Baja, California in 1915 is still in effect. If you want to do business in Mexico, this is the way business is done in Mexico. Okay? I'm not saying it's good or bad. Please, I'm not saying that at all. It's the way business is done in Mexico. So anyhow, they paid off this man, Cantu, and Withington and the others then began their um, 
their, their, their enterprises in, in, in Baja California, okay? And as the revolution went on and ended, okay, Villa and uh, Zapata are both killed, and the so-called constitutionalist, a man named Obregón, becomes the president of Mexico. And so uh, these are the people with whom anyone wanting to set up business in Mexico had to, had, had, had to deal. Now, there were three people called border, but we call them as a group the border barons, who had the idea of starting Agua Caliente. I'm back to Agua Caliente now, which was all these smaller businesses began earlier. Okay, there was a racetrack in T1 in 1916, developed by a San Diegan, James Cofroth. Co Co excuse me, James Cofroth. He was. Uh, he was the fellow that brought the Star of India to San Diego, and he had a lot to do with the zoo and Balboa Park, and he, he was a real philanthropist, this guy. But he was also a boxing entrepreneur and a horse racing promoter. So um, it started then in 19, it started much earlier, 1915, 1920, those, those particular years, okay? Oh, by the way, I meant to end my talk about the reforms, my mention of the reforms in the United States, by saying the federal government finally got into the act with prohibition. You can't drink liquor, they said. Imagine telling us we can't drink liquor. They said it, and they tried to enforce it. This was 1920 that law came in, okay? So it swept through the country, this reform movement did. Anyhow, with prohibition now in effect, there was even more impetus for Americans to go south of the border to do their drinking and whatever other kinds of, uh, of pleasures, let's call them, or vices that they wanted to get, uh, to get into. And uh, three people got together to organize then Agua Caliente, the great, their vision was something uh, uh, different than the small-time entrepreneur. They wanted to open up something that rivaled Monte Carlo, the greatest gambling hall in the world at the time. Maybe not greater than the ones in Hong Kong and Macau, but, but one of the great, great um, gambling halls. A and so the three men who, who started that, uh, started the enterprise were, um, the first one I want to talk about a little bit is Baron Long. Baron Long was the first one who had the idea because he had the contacts with the Mexicans. It's very clear, contacts with the Mexicans, and so he could make the deals. Bowman was born in Mississippi, and he had come across the country and rustled cattle for a while, and then he had gone out to the West Coast, and he became a station master with the Union Pacific Railroad in northern Mexico, okay, in about 1915. Okay, he was a station master, tele telegrapher, and a station master. But, and it was, the station was located below Nogales, okay, in the state of Sonora, the northwestern state of Sonora in Mexico. It was, it doesn't seem like much, because it was out there in the desert and so forth, but the important part of it was that all of the commerce coming into the United States from that part of Mexico had to go through this little town and through his, on his railroad. That's how it was transported, mainly cattle and uh, other sorts of things like um, vegetable, garbanzo beans, and, and that sort of thing. But we're in a revolution, so it's important that these people had a contact, that they could ship goods to the United States and arms could come back to them along the railroad. It was at a time, of course, when the United States was playing neutral toward Mexico, and arms were not supposed to be shipped, but they were shipped at that time, down Bowman, down the railroad that Bowman controlled. Bowman eventually became the customs chief in the town of Nogales, Arizona. Nogales, you'll remember, is split by the international line. There's Mexican Nogales and San Diego Nogales. And he then became the customs officer there. Well, everybody knows that these customs officers have an enormous amount of power. Right? Enormous. They control, especially in the smaller towns, the commerce coming in and out of that town. And boy, they exact a price for what they allow to come in and what they allow to go out. Okay? Or they can do that. I wouldn't say they'll all do that, but Bowman certainly did it. We have the records to show that he did that sort of thing. And so, these Mexicans, 
these Mexican revolutionaries who wanted to ship out cattle in exchange for weaponry, ammunition, and so forth coming down. They made their peace with, with Bowman. And they are the ones, they, the Mexicans, are the ones that won the revolution. And all of a sudden, Bowman, this guy Bowman, his, one of his best buddies, a man named Obregón, is the president of Mexico. So there's a direct tie there, you see, between Bowman and the presidency of Mexico. And so when Bowman said to the president, I think I want to start a beautiful exotic casino, and uh, resort up there in Tijuana, the president said, well, okay, that can, that can be arranged. Okay? <laughs> that can be arranged. So it didn't happen right away. Bowman had a couple of partners who, who came into the show. One was a young fellow by the name of James Crofton. He was more or less the age of the students in this room here, a little older. He got tired of uh, being in a small town in Oregon, in the Dolls on the Columbia River. So he decided he would go to the West Coast and he came down. He ended up here in San Diego and he was a good horseback rider so he rode horseback in circuses for a period here. But that atmosphere gen gen quickly led him to, um, uh, to, to you know, to the, to the gambling outlets, to the drinking outlets, and those sorts of things, which hadn't yet been put in place in terms of prohibition. And so um, he got into that kind of nightclub work, and then he eventually bought some nightclubs, and when these progressives pushed the nightclub south of the border, he established a couple of nightclubs south of the border where he met in Nogales, his friend Bowman, and the two of them then decided to work together to build this great Agua Caliente resort. The third border baron, as he's called, is a place, as a fellow by the name of Baron Long. That's his real name, Baron Long. He didn't just take that name, Baron Long. He liked that name because when he went to Europe, people would call him Baron, you know, and he felt very good about that, and they, they saluted him. So uh, Baron, uh, Baron was, from Indiana. He um, went out to the West Coast. He went to San Francisco where for a period of time, let's say in the early 1920s, maybe a little earlier about then, he was a snake oil salesman on the streets of San, of, of San Francisco. In other words, he was a flim flam artist. He knew how to get people to take chances on health cures and all that kind of stuff. And he worked his way down the coast and, and eventually came down to the Los Angeles area where he established a club in a little town outside of the city of Los Angeles called Vernon. Still there, V-E-R-N-O-N. -E and in that town, which was small and so he could get to know the mayor and get to know the council and so forth, established a club there called the Vernon Club. And where Los Angeles, as I told you earlier, had band dancing and everything else. In the little town of Vernon, okay, next door, it's like San Diego banning everything, but La Mesa having this wonderful open club. Well, people flocked to it, of course. So that's where you could go do your drinking, your gambling. I'm sure there were some young, some ladies around for sale. And uh, he became famous for this Vernon club because he brought young entertainers in there, and many of these young, or some of the young entertainers, later became stars. They became star musicians or star movie stars, and so because he put on a little bit of entertainment to bring people in. But that was his background then. He was a glad hander, was this uh, this fellow. In other words, he knew how to how to shake hands and try to make people happy and uh, that that sort of thing. And so. The Board of Barons decided he would be a good one to bring the movie crowd down to Agua Caliente and celebrities to Agua Caliente. That was his forte. Okay, so Baron Long then joined the three other Board of Barons to think about, to think about possibly establishing this great resort called Agua, Agua Caliente. But they needed who? They needed a Mexican. You can't just go down there and drop in like a parachutist, okay? They needed a Mexican to support the endeavor. If possible, invest in the endeavor. And they did it. And who did they get? They got the new governor of Baja California, who had been sent there by the constitutionalists in Mexico City to govern Baja, to be part of the 
enterprise. So he was like a silent partner in the enterprise, but we know from the correspondence that went back and forth between these people that he was, he was into it up to his neck. Arbolado Rodriguez was his name. He was the Mexican governor, okay? And how important was he? How important did he become? He's way up here in Baja, California, you know, way out on the fringes of Mexico. Well, in the, in, the, in, the, in the first part of the 1930s, from 1932 to 34, Arbolado Rodriguez is so well placed with the Mexican political system that he becomes the president of Mexico. So the Agro Caliente Board of Barons, the American Board of Barons, had a tie to the president of Mexico. That's a pretty good contact to have in high places, okay? So in 1927, they started building Agua Caliente. They started building the resort. The contract for the actual construction of the resort went to, oh, who might this go to? Who might it go? It goes to the brother of the governor. Okay? He gets the contract to build Agua Caliente. And the governor at the same time is building uh, with, with money from the border barons, He's building, not only from them, also from the Mexican government, he's building a great dam outside of Tijuana, which is called the Rodriguez Dam. That's after Arbolano Rodriguez, okay? He built that dam. Uh, as we know, Tijuana, in fact, San Diego, was very short on water. They wanted to dam up the Tijuana River, so they had a reservoir there so that water could be brought down to the growing population center there in in Tijuana. So Rodriguez was at the same time in the late 1920s and as he was working with Agua Caliente building the dam up there. Well, um, I had occasion to look at the, um, the, the orders that uh, Rodriguez was putting into the Mexican government for, for supplies, supplies and um, materials to build that dam, okay? And you would see that he was contracting, getting the money from the government Mexican government, that was, contracting for so much concrete, so many steel bars, and so forth to build this dam. And on the same bill of sale, you also saw that he was getting 500 sheets and uh, things for uh, a, a large number of spoons and forks and kettles. In other words, he was furnishing agua caliente. Pretending it was the dam. <laughs> so that's how Agua Caliente got its sheets and beds. And, you know, there were 30 people working on the dam, and there were 300 beds that were ordered. So it's all in the record, so we can see very clearly this is not all being made up in any, any particular way. Okay? So at any rate, then, Agua Caliente opens to a great fanfare in 1928, and the Celebrities begin to come, and it begins, and it gets its notoriety, and then we have this shootout with which I started the talk. The shootout on a place called the Dyke. The bag, the money in the car, was being transported. As I say, it was the weekend's receipts from Agua, from the casino at Agua Caliente. They were taking those receipts to a bank up in the up in San Diego, the Bank of Italy. Uh, Tijuana had no banks, so that they, to keep the money safe or to get it up into a bank, they would transport it every once in a while, and they knew that people would be watching and possibly thinking about robbing the, the transport, uh, but they took their precautions and they, they sent the money up there on, uh, supposedly on, at times when, uh, at different times, so that the, the schedule would be changed, and so um, the, the idea that this car was trailing the bank car, we'll call it now, the Cadillac, was trailing the bank car, um, indicates that somebody knew, somebody knew when this transport was being sent up, um, up north. One of the bank, these, the two fellows who committed the murders in the, uh, on the dike were, and within a week or so, were, were captured. One of them, one of them was known, uh, one of them was, uh, his name was Marty Colson. And, and Colson, as soon as he was captured, he had been wounded 
And so he was captured in San Diego a few days later, just serendipitously, at the home of a, of a bootlegger. Uh, the bootlegger had bragged that he was going to get a machine gun and start shooting policemen. And so somebody had heard him say that and said to the police chief in San Diego that maybe you ought to check out that guy's home. He might have had something to do, maybe not, but maybe with this machine gunning that went on, on, on the dike. So they go to the home, the police go to the home of this bootlegger and they find sick in bed there, badly wounded in the shoulder. They find one of the uh, attackers, one of the mobsters, and his name was Marty Colson. And Marty Colson, uh, though, was uh, refused to speak. He was soon labeled Silent Marty. He, uh, he may have talked, we don't know, may have talked to some of his cellmates, but he wouldn't talk to his lawyer. He wouldn't talk to any authorities. He just, for several months, while the case was being prepared for the prosecution of Marty Colson and his friend who was caught up in Los, Los, uh, Los Angeles, um, then he was completely silent. So then we come to the day, uh, and then they decide, then they decide through their lawyers to plead guilty because they want to escape the death penalty, guilty of the murder of these guys on the, on the dike, okay? And uh, <clears throat> we get to the point in the legal proceedings where the, they're standing before the judge, and as you know, the judge says at that point to the accused or to the confessed, in this case, murderers, do you have anything you want to say, okay? Do you have anything you want to say? And uh, Marty Colson, who hadn't spoken in three or four months, okay, suddenly stands up and says, I have something to say. And the judge, you know, is taken aback by it. And he said, what did you say? And he says, I, I, I want to, Marty says, I want to say something. And his own lawyer tried to get him to sit down. You know, he didn't know what he was going to say. He hadn't spoken in three months. But Marty insisted on speaking, so they had to listen to him. And Marty then, on told a fantastic story about why this robbery had taken place and why it was a plan that went wrong. And Marty Colson was articulate. He used words, we have his testimony, he used words that I'm sure people in the courthouse didn't understand the meaning of fully, but he, he was self-taught, but he obviously had read a great deal, but he was an articulate, not formally educated, but educated, educated person. And he said, he said that this, this whole tragedy that's occurred, by the way, he said, uh, I don't want, I'm not saying these things because I want to be spared. In fact, I want the death sentence. I want to die in the electric chair or hang, be hanged because of the tragedy which occurred. It wasn't supposed to occur. These guys weren't supposed to die in that car. It was all part of a plot gone wrong. I'm going to tell you about that plot, says Marty. Okay? It's a little convoluted, but it'll just take me a minute to unravel it for you. Okay? What was supposed to happen was, was when that car, when the, when the gangster car pulled up next to the car that they'd shot the tires out on, and they had said, remember I said, they said, give them the bag, give us the bag, the people inside the car, in the front car, in the Cadillac, were supposed to give him the bag. It had all been set up, said Marty, with the police, with the politicians, with the, all the authorities in San Diego, well, the proper authorities in San Diego knew that this was going to happen so that they would just simply hand over the bag to us and it would, it would look like a simple robbery then. Okay? Nobody was supposed to get shot. The tragedy was when people got shot. And so, who, 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 th who worked up this, this particular scheme? And Marty said, well, some of the organized, some of the higher-ups in Agua Caliente conceived of this scheme, okay? And why they did it was, was their plan was to, they were, they were getting tired of paying so much, so, such high bribes to the Mexican authorities. Also, they feared that there would be a change of government in Mexico, and the new government might be opposed to casinos or might be opposed to them having these concessions or contracts. And so what they wanted to do was get out of the business. 
at least temporarily, out of the business. Bowman, this is Bowman, and the rest of them, okay? We don't know that it's Bowman, but that's what the hint is. And so, <clears throat> Marty went on and, 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 and talked about um, how this was, as I say, uh, all set up. And the idea was that some people, some Mexicans, some Hispanics, dressed up as Mexican revolutionaries were supposed to attack Agua Caliente, the resort, okay? And take the money from the vaults, take the money from the casino, basically where the vaults were, the big vaults anyhow, okay? And then they were gonna blow up the place. Then they were supposed to blow up Agua Caliente, and that would be the end of the resort. The owners would leave, they'd get their insurance, they'd also have the money that these revolutionaries, supposed revolutionaries had taken from the vaults, and off they would go to Florida, and maybe they would set up a new casino over there. Okay. That was the idea. But what does the car have to do with that? The car and the, and, the, and, and, the, and the shooting in the car. They thought, according to Marty, they thought, the, the planners of this scheme thought, that by establishing the fact that the route from Agua Caliente to San Diego had become insecure, had become unsafe, that the money car had been robbed, the money car was being robbed and so forth, that that would allow the owners to say, well, it's not safe any longer, so we're going to keep all the money that we earn here or that we get in the casino, we're going to keep that in the vaults of the casino, okay? So when these revolutionaries came in, the vaults would be full of money. See? So they'd have several weeks of money stashed while they said, well, we're, while we're trying to find some armored cars, while we're trying to find proper police support, and so forth and so on. So the money would be stashed in those vaults, and then the vaults would be full, and then they would get a bigger, uh, a bigger return. Now, um, so that was the story, and, uh, and I don't know whether I believe it or whether the authorities believed it, the question for the historian became, did the story have plausibility? Is it possible he's telling the truth? That all these people were paid off to let this thing occur? Okay. And so what I did was I began to examine San Diego at the time. And I looked into what was going on in the city. And lo and behold, there was a grand jury investigation, a state grand jury investigation of corruption in San Diego, because it was so corrupt at the time, okay? And so the fact that there was the possibility that people were being paid off to let things happen seemed to be obvious. The possibility was certainly obvious. i just tell you one example of this at the time, 1928-29, okay? The American Legion, the California branch of the American Legion wanted to come to San Diego for its annual convention, okay? All these hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, maybe thousands of conventioneers coming to San Diego to party. It's a huge plum for the city to get this, uh, this convention, okay? But Anybody that knows anything about American Legionnaires know they like to drink. And we're in the middle of prohibition. And they can't get their booze. What are we going to do about that? So, the, the, um, the Legionnaires made a plain look. If we come to San Diego, you're going to, you, the city council, the city fathers, police, you're going to have to arrange for us to get our booze. So when the Legionnaires came to San Diego for their con convention, they were assured they would get their booze. And representatives of the Chamber of Commerce handed them brochures which said, this is where you'll find your booze. That was. Now how do we know that? Because one of the bootleggers who was supposedly supplying that booze, when the Legionnaires got here, he found out that the Legionnaires were going to other, another bootlegger. They weren't going to him. He thought he had fixed everything with the city council. But they were going to another bootlegger. So he was pissed. And he blew the whistle on them. He blew the whistle. So uh, that's just one of the stories of the, and, and so that's, that's, that 
f added fuel to it. There were other things that happened, you know, payoffs to allow um, prisoners to get out of jail and, and just all sorts of things were revealed in this grand jury investigation. In fact, San Diego soon afterward changed its form of government, okay, trying to clean things up. Now, whether they've cleaned things up or not, I'll let you decide that sort of thing. I don't know. But anyhow, that was the plot. And it does seem to me that under the circumstances that we've talked about, the, the contextualization which historians use to lend support to their general argument, you could say that it is plausible that Colson was telling, was telling the truth. Okay. At any rate, we go on now with the remainder of the story. Prohibition took a little chunk out of Agua Caliente, but not very much. People still flocked down there because they wanted to be near the movie stars, and they had wonderful uh, drinks for people. They brought the best liquor over from Europe, so forth, to serve to people there. The meals and so forth were spectacular. And uh, so uh, Agua Caliente was, by about 34, 35, had completely recovered after a couple of years of, of letdown because of the... Uh, the Depression. You know, San Diego and the West Coast wasn't hit too hard by that depression anyhow. We didn't have great industries out here like the Middle Western states and New York and so forth, so that we didn't have that, that, that terrible pressure that uh, was placed on other states because of that, uh, because, of the, uh, because of the Depression. And then in 1934, um, Mexico, um, the party system was just starting there in Mexico, really. And um, they picked a man to be the next president. It was Lazaro Cardenas. But he turned out, as he took office in 1935, he turned out to be, of all things, a reformer. He's like one of these progressives. Okay? And so he said, in 1935, he said, I'm going to close down all casinos in Mexico. And he did it. He says, we want Mexicans. He had not only a big program about land reform, about educational reform, all those things, but he also had a program about reforming Mexicans. We're going to make them industrious. We're going to make them yeoman farmers. We're going to make them, we're going to get them out of control of the Catholic Church. We're going to give them a piece of land and the, and the tools to farm it, and so forth. Okay. So he started this big reform program, and in late 1935, he closed down Agua Caliente. So, uh, at least the gambling part of it, the casino part of Agua Caliente. He actually turned it over to the um, employees of Agua Caliente, the people who were the, uh, the servants and the uh, hat check people and those kinds of people, to run it for their own profit and so forth. But nobody wanted to go to Agua Caliente if there was no gambling, so that they they, they couldn't, and they went to, Mexico, went to Mexico City, did these employees, and they said to the president, look, we're not, we're not making it, we gotta have gambling back up there at Agua Caliente, and the president said, no way, you, you are going to become farmers, and so I will give you some land in Baja California, and I will give you some tools so you can grow some crops. Well, anybody that's looked at the soil in Baja California knows it's not very good, and so that was not attractive to these people. And so they went back home uh, disappointed. And soon enough, in 19, just 36, 37, smaller gambling places began to bubble up, uh, sort of subterranean places, okay? Back street places and that kind of thing. And uh, some went to Ensenada, some went to Rosarito, some were right there in Tijuana. And the president, Cardenas, said, that's it. I'm not gonna allow this to run anymore. And he expropriated then Agua Caliente. He said, I'm going to take Agua Caliente and I'm going to make it a technological school, I'm going to, which it is today, a technological school, sort of a middle level school where the sons, later the daughters, but first part just the son, can learn a trade, so that an honest trade, so they won't have to be involved in any of this gambling business. The technological school, as I say, is still there. It's uh, one of the best ones in all of Mexico, as a matter of fact, this school. So it took hold, took root there, and as, as I say, is um, still there. They had such extraordinary luck at the beginning with, um, with their teachers, okay? Uh, the Spanish Civil War was going on at the time, and the Spanish liberals, some of the Spanish liberals, Republicans, who were being buffeted by um, 
by the fascists, Franco and the fascists, decided to take accept exile in Mexico. So philosophers came over and uh, historians and others. And Cardenas, the president of Mexico, then sent them to this technological school in Tijuana. So you had a renowned philosopher who had done, done beautiful work with philosophy, <coughs> teaching, teaching these kids there in, uh, in aqua caliente mathematics and so forth. It's quite a, quite a story. At any rate then, aqua caliente was, uh, was closed down. The racetrack continued, okay? You couldn't gamble there, but you could you know, watch the races there. So it continues, and it, it, it continues really through the 30s and 40s on up into the 60s. Alicio, the famous Alicio from San Diego, takes charge of the racetrack in the 1940s, and it continues until it burns down in 1960. And now it's the 1960s, it's not a racetrack anymore for horses. There's a dog, a dog track out in the, same, in the same, same area. Now, quickly then, what happened to um, these border barons? What happened to the, the major, major characters which I have uh, mentioned, mentioned in this story? The border barons all made an easy shift from their enterprise there at Agua Caliente into other sorts of enterprises, okay? And um, whether they be political or um, economic enterprises. They all died millionaires. They all died in their beds. Nobody was the victim of any particular, none of them anyhow was the victim of any, any, particular, any particular violence. Bowman, Bowman was uh, from, as I told you, was from Arizona. He became the head of the Democratic National Committee and in the 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt became the President of the United States, he thought he was headed for a big job in that administration and wanted to become the ambassador to Mexico. Um, uh, when he pushed that pretty hard, uh, Roosevelt uh, didn't, didn't go along with that plan because, why? Because Bowman had to become involved in some tax problems. He had been skimming funds from Agua Caliente from the casino. In other words, unreported taxes were his problem and he had to pay back a huge, huge tax bill to escape going to, uh, to, going to prison. And President Roosevelt didn't want a tax evader than serving as ambassador to Mexico. Crofton, the young f fellow who came down from, uh, from Oregon, he opened up a couple of breweries here in, uh, in San Diego. He was, he was badly hurt in an uh, airplane accident uh, in the 1930s, and so he was kind of crippled, but he had some great cattle ranches up around Tehachapi. He raised... Um, Thoroughbred horses brought over special strains from uh, Europe, raced them in the Kentucky Derby and other races, and uh, he, he succumbed a bit earlier in his early 60s because of injuries he suffered in that, in that plane crash. And the final border baron, the U.S. border baron anyhow, um, Baron Long, he became the owner or the leasee of the famous Biltmore Hotel So he in, in Los Angeles. And it's, um, you know, it was a, it's a glamorous hotel. The Academy Awards they were held there for many years. He 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 put his glad-handing capabilities into effect there, and established a world-famous, uh, as I say, hotel, um, noted for its uh, celebrity celebrity presence. So we just sort of continued what he had done down there at Agua Agua Caliente. And the final Baron, the silent one was Abelardo Rodriguez, and he had been, even while he was in Baja California, had been amassing a great fortune through various kinds, as I say, of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial ventures, golf courses and movie houses and hotels. He, he, he controlled the fishing industry off of Ensenada and other, uh, other, other enterprises. So he died a very, a, a very wealthy man, okay? And as far as Marty Coulson's concerned, um, he was sent to, um, San, uh, San, not San Quentin, he was sent to Folsom Prison, Folsom Prison because that was a prison that didn't allow any parole at the time. And he tried to escape several times. Uh, and uh, one time when he tried, he and his partner, a fellow named Sam Sell, had manufactured a couple of pistols, or had made a couple of pistols, ingeniously made them out of strips of wood and little pieces of steel and matches that, you know, you'd strike them and it would send powder going, shoot the bullet out. So those pistols 
those pistols are still uh, on display at the museum at Folsom, and they're, they're, they're prized possessions. Nobody can figure out really how they work. They're really ingenious, ingenious. But when he, he broke out with this other fellow, they had these two, tried to break out with these two pistols. They, they did capture the warden, and they put a pistol to his head. But um, there were too many guards around them. Even if they shot the warden, it just was hopeless. You know, there were too many other guards out there surrounding the area that they were in. And so Marty Colson committed suicide. He put one of those pistols to his temple and, and shot himself. So that was the end of him. Now, as far as uh, finally, then, Agua Caliente itself goes, um, if you went down there today to Tijuana, um, and you went down Revolucion, the main, that's the main tourist street, okay? And you just looked out east a little bit, just sort of looked east a little bit, because Agua Caliente is now in the middle of town. Uh, you'll see a huge spire going up there, a huge chimney going up. That chimney housed um, a funnel that took the fumes and uh, other things like that from the heating devices, from the heating plant and carried them up and out of the city. But it's surrounded by a minaret, and the minaret has some beautiful hand-painted Spanish tiles up top. And that's the landmark. That's the landmark of Agua Caliente. And it's, it still uh, has other hand-painted tiles on the campus. Most of the rest of the things have been taken away by, oh, either art dealers or um, antique dealers or private people who've gone in there and taken things. But it's now pretty well stripped of most of its glory. The swimming pool is, has been refurbished. It's still, it's, it's, it's quite beautiful. And you can see other little, little, as I say, remnants. But that's all they are, are remnants. Everything else has been, has been taken out of the place. The students there now still say there's a presence of, uh, of Agua Caliente there. They say that Al, Capone, Al Capone's cars is buried underneath in one of the tunnels. The tunnels carried um, the, the electrical wires and the heating tubes and so forth. Lots of tunnels underneath Agua Caliente. And, uh, but Al Capone's car is supposedly there, or one of his cars. Whether it is or not, I don't know. Um, and nobody seems to, to, to know about that. The tunnels have now been sealed off, so you can't get there. Into them, uh, into them to look. Every once in a while, a fog, a little fog, drifts over Agua Caliente, and they say that is the um, that 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 is a ballerina who used to dance here at uh, Agua Caliente and was murdered by a Mexican general who got who was trying to court her and became jealous when she turned her attentions elsewhere. So he murdered her, but she's remained there and she floats across the campus every once in a while. And singing the beautiful songs, and so there's still a certain, a certain, a certain myths and certain ghosts uh, connected to uh, to Agua Caliente, and uh, I don't know how, how I feel about it. I've been down there quite a few times, and uh, despite all of the, you know, the underground, other-handed stuff, and all the corruption connected to it, and the murders were certainly terrible. Um, seems to me that Agua Caliente was a place. I wish I had known. Thank you. Is Jimmy Hoffa there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if you feel like I do, but I just feel like I watched a great movie. <laughs> great time for questions now. Oh, I talked a long time. I didn't mean to talk quite that long. Yes, sir. Um, that was a superb uh, talk. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, it's, I think it's both fascinating and, and depressing in many ways. Yeah, it is. You know, yes. the, the interconnectedness. It is. It is. Um, I, I'm wondering about the Copleys. Um, I don't know a lot about them, but I, I know they're one of the more in, influential families um, in San Diego history. How do they fit in, it, if at all? Do you know? Which family? The Copley family. The Copley family. Yeah. Not the Copleys, but other big families uh, certainly did. Uh, certain San Diego families. For instance, Spreckles. The Spreckles, early Spreckles family was in it up to his neck. I, I never came across any document or letter or correspondence or that would link the Copleys to this. So, so I, don't, I don't think they were connected. I don't even know much about the Copleys. I'm not sure when they came to San Diego. Do you know? No, I, I just read a few pieces in the local reader. I think uh, they were active in the uh, 20s and 30s. So, were they? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. 
I, I, I never been asked that question before. I'll look into that a little bit. Uh huh. Okay. And yes. that was my question too. Mike Davis and Jim Miller uh, published a book a few years ago, San Diego that the tourists don't see. Uh huh. And most of this fund, you know, their attention uh, to labor unions, I mean, both sides of the borders and all the things going on with the yes. labor movement. Are you familiar with that? Any connection to Agua Caliente? With, with. The labor unions and the issues that they were talking about? Well, uh, yes, as a matter of fact. Um, the labor unions in Mexico were, were very powerful, and um, syndicalism was strong. And so uh, virtually all workers, virtually all workers in, that worked at Agua Caliente you know, were, were unionized, okay? And they did put um, a lot of pressure on the border barons and on even Mexican authorities to make sure that those union people were we're taken care of. How are they taken care of? Well, the taxi, the, the taxi drivers, for instance, okay? The Americans wanted to take tour buses right from uh, San Diego, the city of San Diego, right down across the border, take the tour buses right to Agua Caliente. And the taxi says, no way. You take, we'll, we'll take them from the border to Agua Caliente. And they did it, okay? They were, they were extremely, extremely powerful. And the other thing is, that immediately comes to my mind, is that, you know, Mexico, when this revolution that they went through ended, at least the fighting phase ended, a new constitution was, uh, was, was adopted, okay? And that, that constitution contained the most progressive labor law of its time, Article 123, okay? In which it guaranteed eight-hour days and equal work for men and women, and it was really, really very progressive, okay? And there, was a, and there still is, in Mexico, labor dispute boards where if a laborer feels like any laborer feels like he's been he or she's been mistreated whether it be it can be a maid or it could be somebody working in a factory remember they go to this labor board and it 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 they very often receive some kind of relief for that it's, it's very very strong because the labor unions have been strong back in the pre-government i mean the, uh, the official government in mexico too what happened with the cars how come that backfired the the, um, Why did it? What it did, did it backfire? Because all Colson said, and that's the only evidence we have, this guy saying that it was fixed. We expected the policeman not to interfere with this, and so forth and so on. And his talk went, went, was pretty detailed and long. And he talked about them passing policemen on the way and nothing, nothing happening. You know, and that, that, that. they thought it was all, all, all going to be very, 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 very clear. But there was never any in. The, the investigation itself was quickly whitewashed. Uh, Agu the Agua Caliente people said immediately, we'll handle this ourselves, we'll look into any problems, you know, and, and then they said, well, there is, there is nothing. Uh, there was one name mentioned by Colson, uh, I, I think it was just a first name, maybe it was a last name, and Agua Caliente claimed we don't have anybody by that name here, and all that st stuff went on. But I, I must say just one other little thing, it wasn't just um, this incident in mobsters that the border barons themselves were under pressure all the time. They received extortion letters continually, you know, because uh, we're going to kidnap you and so forth. And they almost, they grabbed one of them, Crofton, at the Santa Fe Railroad Station briefly for one period of time. So uh, kidnapping had become sort of the modus vivendi of these people. You know, the Lindbergh case is the, is the classic one. Uh, there was a, a development at the South Island of the Coronado Islands, uh, which I've, I've read somewhere involved a casino. Was that, do you, do you know of that? And was it affiliated with uh, Caliente? I, I, I do know about it, but it, and it was not in any way affiliated, okay? That different groups of people beside the border baron um, form corporations to establish casinos in other places. And, and one of them, was on the Coronado Islands. In fact, the barons themselves had thought about establishing Agua Caliente down there on the sea where the bull ring is now, the, the new bull ring in Tijuana, okay? Because um, these casinos, the owners of the casinos always liked the idea of yachts pulling in. It adds a certain cachet to the whole operation. 
and Coronado was one of them where they would, you know, we're going to get them out there and keep them there for a period of time. I don't know why that one collapsed. A lot of, all the other ones collapsed for lack of uh, maybe financing in lots of, lots of cases, okay? The, 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 the Agro Caliente uh, enterprise was financed by, by um, public shares. The barons didn't put their own money in that. They sold public shares to that thing. And when they wanted more money, they put out, excuse me, they put out more shares. And the problem with the one on Coronado Island is there's no water out there, and so, so they know, but lots of people going by say they've seen it, and they've seen the remains of that casino there. Oh, I have. Oh, you yeah, have, too. I've, I've been in that little harbor many, many times. You have. Uh, but mostly in the early 1960s. I see. And, um, yeah. Oh, what yeah. was there in the 60s? What was there? Oh, there was a, a large building. It was built on the... <clears throat> on the south side of the South Island Harbor. Yes. And um, I'm going to say, I'm going to guess uh, three stories high with um, uh, pylons right into the water. Okay. And the water there is crystal clear. I mean, it could be the Caribbean. It's just gorgeous. Yes. And the building had been burned uh, and it was abandoned at that time. I see. I'm going to say 19. I was a boy. Uh, 62, 3, 4, 5 sure. in that time period. And I saw, we used to go there many, many times. My dad, I used to go with my dad and he had a small boat and we'd go out there uh, and buy lobsters from the I lobster see. people out there. Uh -huh. And then years later I became a scuba diver. Well, I was 64. Yeah. I started scuba diving out there. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I had heard that it burned. I had heard that also, you know, yeah. that it burned down. But I, I really know nothing about it. And I don't know anybody that's really investigated that particular casino. Yeah, when, I, when I saw it, it had been burned, but the interior was burned, the exterior was intact. I see. And it, it just hadn't collapsed. Uh -huh. And later, of course, it, it was dismantled you know, entirely. It was still there in the uh, early 60s. I see. Well, just out of curiosity, do you happen to know any of the, the Spanish you know, scholars or academics that were in exile during uh, you know, fascist Spain? Uh, it'd be I don't. I didn't know. No, they they were here, and uh, that would be in 1938 that they were, yeah, 38. But look, um, there are his, There there is a history, or there are a couple of histories of that technological school, okay, in Spanish, okay, and there. Um, I don't think they're easily available over here. But if you ever go to Tijuana, go to that school. They, you can get them, they'll probably just give you some, some of the teachers there have made, have written them up. And I know those names, the names of those people are in, it's a good point, I, I should have followed up more. No, 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 just a curiosity, what's the name of the school now? Is it, it's not Agua Caliente, obviously. No, no, it's just called El Tecnológico, the technical. And I don't think it has a number, it's, everybody just calls it El Tecnológico. Okay, you can go. You're free to go there and just walk. It's so lovely to walk across the campus there. You know, it's easy to get to and so. Forth. And their little bookstore there, they they have these. I know there are two books on the history of that. Just on the right tour bus down there. If you if you <laughs> look, if you run into if you run into trouble, you don't want to do that, uh, drop me an email and I'll see if I can find out. You want the names of those professors is what you want, right? Yeah, I was just curious because I'm interested in, 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 you know, Spain for a lot of different reasons, especially fascist Spain. And so I was just curious who was exiled there, probably some interesting characters. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and there, there's a whole book on the exiles to Mexico, the Spanish exiles to Mexico, that I know of. But, but to Tijuana, see, Cardenas, the president, just sent him up here, these, these teachers, because he was trying to, he was trying to, there was, had been some riots in the town, he was trying to calm the circumstances by, and he even sent some money up and so forth to, for public works and so forth, trying to calm the situation in, in Tijuana. Because, look, everybody in Tijuana, virtually everybody worked at the casino. Okay, virtually everybody, or at least was connected in some way. You went perhaps to a gas station and or to a, a um, 
haberdashery or whatever. And we, but almost everything was directly connected to that casino, so that everybody worked there. And um, the book has uh, some of the pay records that was of these people that worked there, and they got pretty good pay for working in that casino compared to wages in the rest of Mexico. Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, I was going to ask, uh, you know, you said that they had to, uh, the, the, the barons had to um, allow or, you know, build schools or different, you know, yes. and things like that. Or do you think that, is your opinion that you think the, the people down there benefited more from the casinos being there or did it affect them more? Well, I, I don't know. Well, you, uh, you, can, you can judge that for yourself. I'll say this, that the Tijuana people, Tijuanaenses, are somewhat split on that. And they say, to, to, you know, both sides. And one of them says, because it is the greatest historical landmark in Tijuana. Tijuana doesn't have very many landmarks. Historical land was a brand new city. And so uh, they say this was a, this, if, if you say, what's the most important historical landmark, they will say Agua Caliente, even this, these few remnants that they have, uh, they have left. And they're sorry because they say, they're sorry that it left because it, as I say, it brought um, publicity and it brought a little bit of notoriety, I guess, too, but that has never bothered them. And so, um, as far as employment, economics, and being an economic reason and the other social reason, they wish it was still around, okay? But there are numbers of, especially political Tiboenses, who say that it's another example of American imperialism and therefore it's just as well that it's gone. Okay. And they have, they have established a really good school there. So they say, look what we got now. We got this wonderful school, you know. And so, it's but they're pretty mixed on that. On their, as far as I'm concerned, I don't. I have, no, I don't. Because uh, I'm not Mexican and I don't feel the same things they feel about it. You know, I would love it. It's still there because I would go. <laughs> <laughs> I have just been chewing to tell a story, and I think I could do it very briefly, and I think you find it entertaining. In, um, I, I believe that the association between Agua Caliente, the, 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 the dog track, and the taxi cab union continued and continued and continued. Um, and here's why. In 1968, my wife worked as a translator at Children's Hospital, and the taxi cabs would bring uh, disabled children to Children's Hospital from Mexico. And they had a free run back and forth. And once a year, the uh, taxi cab drivers had a big party for the employees of Children's Hospital, especially my wife, because she was the Spanish language translator. Uh -huh. And so all these children that are camp come in with so many terrible conditions uh, were cared for for free at Children's Hospital. And it was the taxi cabs that put the whole show on and they put it on at Agua Caliente. And I remember it well because it was, without a doubt, the drunkest I've ever been in my life. And they just kept filling my glass. And, and I, since my childhood, been partial to that sort of thing. <laughs> and when we got to the border, it's 1968, there were no cars, none. There was no cars at the yeah. border, zero. And I ended up trying to get out in the southbound lane. And it's amazing I never went to jail or anything for that. Uh -huh. it's just amazing. I should have. <laughs> That's a good story. Do I still have a hangover? <laughs> yeah, I I'm sure I had one that lasted, uh -huh. but I don't recall it to be the hangover part. Was uh -huh. there a free trade agreement between the American organized crime and the Mexican organized crime, or did they collaborate in some way? Uh, Jonathan, there, there, there were. A series of free trade agreements, which had been established, okay, they'd get them started and they would fall through. And uh, again, they were always considered to be, uh, I don't know, somewhat, somewhat controversial, okay, the, the fair trade agreements. And I think that's still the way people feel about a lot of people feel about them. But I, I remember reading that um, one of the things the federal government would do to try to make Tiwa Wednesdays sort of more politically close to the government, which is a long ways away in Mexico City, would be to promise them a, a free trade agreement. 
there wasn't any kind of organized crime like, you know, today it's all organized. But, but then, I don't think there, I didn't know of any organized. So in terms of the gambling and all of the, that went on at the racetrack initially? No. I don't think there were any Mexicans trying to muzzle in on that. What, what, the, what, the, what the entrepreneurs had to do, though, what they had to do was pay off all these union bosses, okay? Because once, if one of the union bosses complained that our workers were being mistreated, and they did this, they did this as a matter of fact, when, when the racetrack was, just when it was opening, just when it was opening, they, they were behind schedule a little bit. So the people who were in charge of sort of putting the finishing touches on the racetrack and so forth, they brought, back, brought down a bunch of black people from the United States to finish up things. Scott work, but, but it had to be done, okay? Ooh, the Mexican unions complained about that. Black people were sent back and Mexicans were fit into those jobs. Yeah, very powerful. Yes, sir. What was the population roughly at that time, you know, in the 30s and, and oh. or like roughly? 30,000. 30,000? Yes. Yeah. About 30,000. It, it, and, and it had grown rapidly during the 20s, you see, and on in the 30s. The, the, and a big expansion came in the 1940s. 1940s was the big expansion. When, the war, when World War II, the Navy started going down there and, and adding a lot to the income and so forth, and the U.S. made its arrangements with the Mexican government for the transport of certain of items, you know, and so forth. That, war material and that sort of thing, that Tijuana became an important border city. Well, also Mexican laborers were brought into the U.S. to work in exactly. the fields while the Mexican-Americans left the industry. That's so right. probably Tijuana was a staging area for the recruiting of laborers. Mm, could have been. Yeah. It's, yeah. The Bracero so it's outside of the Bracero movement. The Bracero movement is basically Texas, of course. But, but the idea is right, yeah. No. So it was just a town, <laughs> just a little town in the 30s. It was just a little town, and it was really small before that. I mean, you know, a couple of hundred people, and then it slowly, slowly built up a bit, little bit. But uh, it's just during Prohibition, when people went there for drinking, that it started to get, it, it took off a bit. Mm -hmm. well, yes, ma'am. Um, a friend of mine is a film historian who's especially interested in silent movies. And he's uncovered something that he thinks that nobody has really paid attention to, which is, um, which may have a connection, I'm thinking, um, in Hakumba. Uh -huh. Turns out that that was a movie hub in the 1920s. It, there was a movie studio, and uh, it was a, apparently the most important outside of Hollywood location. Yes. They had a direct train line going from Hollywood that ended in Hakumba and just spilled out people. It was right before the, that huge trestle. So uh -huh. I guess you could go further, but yeah. it was, they ended the line, ended in Hakumba, movie, all of the same people who would frequent uh, Aqua Caliente, they went there, Louise Brooks for one, uh -huh. uh, went there and, and made really, really big Hollywood movies. And now there's, there's practically nothing left, and there's a couple of ruins, such oh, as the resort and the big hotel where they stayed and so forth. Um, so he's trying to uncover all there's, this there's stuff. There's also, in my neighborhood, there's, there's a little, Subsection I would call Talmadge. Mm -hmm. I will start by Norman Talmadge. Yeah. And Western yeah. Keaton had a house there, and so all yeah. these people were living close by. It, it really, San Diego was a, a, a place for Hollywood people to come, but I'm thinking that Hakumba is really, uh, I mean, if there's a back road into Tijuana, which I'm sure there probably yeah. was, sure. uh, it would yeah. be really close. Yes. So it would it would perhaps be a little early for Agua Caliente, but maybe it would be one of the incentives of all the people were there and they wanted to drink and there was prohibition and yes. where would they go? So yes. maybe there's, there could be some additional connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah. I didn't know about that. I, I knew that, that I know some movies were made in, in Hakumba, yeah. 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 That was union stuff, wasn't it, Jonathan? Well, I think that the unions in, um, in Hollywood one of the reasons that people came down here to make movies and so forth was because of, of union, union issues up there. Orson Welles right, made a, in, I think, 58, A Touch uh, of Evil, but that was a, that's much later. Uh -huh. Kind of riding on the wave of that whole... That was... Hollywood, San Diego, TJ Connection. Oh, yeah, that movie, something. Yeah. That's film noir, yeah. 
What else, my friends? Um, in that case, thank you so much. Oh, a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure.